Good evening, everyone. Welcome. If we could ask you to take a seat, we're going to get started. And I just want to assure you, it doesn't matter which seat you're sitting on, we're not going to make any assumptions about your political affiliations tonight, depending on what side of the aisle you are. In fact, I know some of you personally, and I know you're sitting in the wrong seats for that. Good evening. My name is Kenny Blank, and on behalf of the trustees of the Blank Family Foundation, including Arthur and Stephanie Blank, who will be joining us here in a moment, we are all tonight thrilled to have you here for the fourth installment of the Blank Family Foundation Speaker Series. We're very pleased you could join us for what I know will be an outstanding and provocative conversation with tonight's guest, political analyst and journalist Jeff Greenfield of CBS News. The Blank Foundation launched the Speaker Series last year as a way of encouraging dialogue on important issues of the day. And while this dialogue does begin here tonight in this room, it's important to note that it will continue afterwards on our website, blankfoundation.org, where you'll find additional resources and information. We invite you to go online and weigh in with your thoughts and comments, and also share this program this evening with your friends and family through blogs and streaming video. Let me, let me quickly extend a warm welcome also to our partners, the League of Women Voters. During tonight's reception, League members will be here to provide us with information on upcoming candidate forums and share copies of voter guides. From Morehouse College tonight, we have Professor Ron Thomas and his journalism students who are here covering tonight's event for class. So let's all remember, everything tonight is on the record. <laughs> Welcome also to the MTV Street Team, Shelby Highsmith, MTV's citizen journalist who is reporting on young voter engagement in the presidential election. And also our thanks go to Georgia Public Broadcasting, GPB, uh, will be re-airing this program uh, of the election coverage and using it on its, uh, for its web coverage, radio and TV, and educational programming. I also want to let you know that tonight's program will be rebroadcast nationally on Cirrus XM Radio in the coming weeks, so you'll want to check your listings for the dates and times of that. Let me briefly run through the order of tonight's events. Following Jeff's presentation, we'll open up the floor for a Q&A, which will be moderated by our foundation president, Penny McPhee. There'll be microphones throughout the room. Our staff has those, so if you have a question, please stand up, make yourself identified so we can get a microphone to you and, to you and make sure your questions are heard. Afterwards, we'll close out with the opportunity to continue our dialogue over food and drink. There's been a lovely reception organized out here through these back doors. And now on to tonight's program. Jeff Greenfield's biography is printed in your program, so I won't recite his many accomplishments, but I wanted to share with you a couple of observations about why we are particularly excited that Jeff has taken time out of an incredibly busy time for him to be with us. Without question, this is a historic, really in many ways unprecedented election with compelling dynamics. We have the first African American to be nominated by a major party for president. We have the first woman to run on the Republican Party's presidential ticket. And there, of course, is this cry from both parties for change, the buzzword of this election. But at the same time, a struggle for both parties to define what change really means and which candidate is in the best position to deliver on that change. We have a dramatically new media landscape, new media, new communications channels influencing both campaign tactics and the flow and timing of information in this race. There's been a redrawing of the electoral map with many new states and more states in play than perhaps we've seen in many elections. And there's more young people engaged, uh, more money is being spent on this election for sure, and candidates who have become not just famous politicians now, but they've really become really celebrities in their own right, rock stars. We have candidates with more experience, candidates with less experience, candidates who are young, candidates not so young, and many questioning whether any of that really matters. So these are just some of the highlights of our discussion tonight, questions that I hope you'll ask, and really the beginning of an unforgettable storyline that is the 2008 presidential election. So how do we as citizens and as voters sort through all this information and find meaning in these dynamics? It's certainly not easy. In times like these, we need a seasoned and objective voice, or at least as objective as they can come nowadays, amidst a sea of talking heads and political pundits those voices are becoming few and far between. Fortunately, we have Jeff Greenfield now, not only to tell us about how to approach these issues and think about them, but to give us an analysis and a historical perspective that helps us understand what is often lost or distorted in today's 24-hour news cycle. Intelligence that ultimately helps us make informed, hopefully informed decisions 
about voting. Always delivered with insight, often with good humor. We're lucky to have him here with us this evening and in our living rooms and our computers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Greenfield. Well, good evening, um, or as some of you folks say down here, how you doing? Or as we say in New York, what are you looking at? <laughs> uh, I want to thank the Blank Foundation, not just for inviting me, but for following the first rule of political tactical advance work, which we are seeing here tonight, which is if you want to describe your candidate as speaking to an overflow crowd, just make sure the room is not too big. Um, and if you think I'm kidding, I'm not. Um, it is much more important to have the press see you speak in an overflow crowd in a room that seats 200 than if you had 1,000 people in a room that seats 2,000. That's one of the first things I learned in politics 40 years ago uh, as a young pup working in Robert Kennedy's campaign, and it sort of stayed with me. Um, I'm really pleased that the speaker series inverts the norm. The normal thing is to have somebody like me talk at you for a longer period of time and then have a little bit of time for questions. What we're going to do is something different. I'm going to take, I don't know, 20 or 25 minutes to lay out some things I think are worth thinking about. And then we've got a lot more time for questions, because I know what I think. I'm much more interested in what you think. I would only ask that we come to a common understanding of what a question is. Um, <laughs> because a 10-minute speech followed by so that's not a question. And also, in fairness, it just it leaves room for a lot more folks. So um, the only thing I tell you that I'm not going to do, I, I don't care what, you know, you can take me to Guantanamo. I'm not going to do this. You can waterboard me. I'm not going to predict. And the reason that I'm not going to predict is I don't know how. The very first book I ever co-wrote ended in 1972 predicting that the next president of the United States was going to be New York Mayor John Lindsay. Uh, and um, it's kind of like what happened to me in college. You might want to listen to this, folks. When, uh, as a freshman, I got astonishingly, profoundly, almost fatally drunk for the first time in my life, and it cured me. I mean, whatever else my sins are, I will never become an alcoholic. I can't stand the taste of this stuff. Well, one experiment in prediction was enough for me. Uh, if I could predict, no offense, I wouldn't be predicting the presidential campaign. I'd have bought the Powerball ticket. <laughs> and I might not even be here. Um, but the other thing is, uh, you know, I'm not sure what it is about people in my business that convinces them that they know how to do this. I think it's all the people who come up to us and say, so who's going to win? You know, and if you get asked that enough, you think you actually know. But just remember something. Back in 2000, we couldn't get it right even after everybody voted. <laughs> so. The idea that we have some magical insight. Just take a look at the, I mean, by the way, we do this every four years. The polls that are taken eight months, nine months, two, three months out, bear no relationship to what happens in the campaign, and we have seen it yet again. And this is why the best thing anybody ever said about prediction and polling was not said by somebody in my line of work, but was said by Kevin Nealon on Saturday Night Live when he said uh, in a recent poll, 85% of Americans said if the election were held today, they would really be surprised. <laughs> um, and you should, you know, those of you who are obsessed with the daily upticks and downticks you ought to keep that in mind. So I want to take a step back and offer you a few notions about what I think is really worth thinking about in this campaign, how we got to where we are. And, and in addition to which, and I want to spend more time on this in the question period, what happens after November 4th, which in my view is beginning to over, particularly after the events of the last 48 hours, is beginning to overshadow uh, the question even of who's going to win, however devoted you may be one way or the other. So to begin with, and I'm glad Kenny mentioned this, the mantra, in some sense this entire election can be defined by the notion of change and how the campaigns and the parties and the primary process and the general election has responded to it. It's not right that in every election voters are angry or disgruntled. I mean, Americans love to make fun of their politicians, but sometimes we are not disgruntled at all. Sometimes, if such a word exists, we are highly gruntled. Uh, that is, we're happy, we're okay. It happened with Ronald Reagan's re-election in 84, it happened with Bill Clinton in 96, and it happened in 2000 
when we thought peace and prosperity was a permanent condition. So that when we had that bizarre runoff, except for people who were really partisan, the, most of the country really said, uh, you know, it, just get this settled before the playoffs <laughs> so we can, you know, pay attention. Uh, that is not the case this year. Uh, before the subprime crisis, before the credit crunch, before the gasoline price rise, 75% of this country said the country was seriously off on the wrong track. And while I don't like polls that predict, that's a, the reason why I pay attention to that number is that it doesn't require anything except asking people their gut feeling. It doesn't require a resume full of information. Just how do you think things are going? And 75% before all this, it's now up to about 80 or more, tells you something. First, uh, it, tell, it told the Republican Party that four more years was not the slogan this year. Sometimes it is. In 1988, George Herbert Walker Bush basically ran as Ronald Reagan's third term because most of the country was prepared to keep things going. Um, this year, the, there was no way for the Republicans to argue, look what we've done, look, look how happy you are with the way things are, keep us in power. And why, what that meant was it was the only circumstance, in my view, that permitted the nomination of John McCain, who, after all, was a person heartily disliked by the conservative base of his party. He'd, he'd broken with them on taxes, he'd broken with them on the environment, he'd broken with them on campaign finance reform, and he'd uh, held hearings that exposed some of their big shot lobbyists as crooks. Uh, this was not who they wanted. But, be, but, but because there was no appetite for the next George W. Bush, for a continuation, none of the other uh, uh, candidates seemed to possess the ability to define a difference and there were enough Republicans who understood that to give McCain enough votes to secure his nomination. Now, it also required, as Rich Lowry of the National Review brilliantly analyzed, it, it almost required active cooperation from the other Republicans. Uh, it was almost, he says, as if McCain gathered all his rivals and said, okay, here's what I need you to do for me. Uh, Mitt Romney, I need you not to run as the former moderate governor of Massachusetts, but to run as a social conservative so that people will think you have no consistent principles. Uh, uh, Mike Huckabee, I need you to emerge from nowhere and go and win that evangelical vote to win the Iowa caucuses to keep Mitt Romney from running up a, a momentum. Rudy, uh, Julia, I need you to go to New Hampshire, spend three million bucks and get out, leave, <laughs> so that I can have all the votes to the, to the center. And Fred Thompson, I need you to wake up just long enough. <laughs> to split the right-wing vote or the conservative vote in South Carolina, give me a victory there. And, and that's what happened. But it would not have happened had there been an appetite for continuation. Republicans, unlike Democrats, are an orderly party. They tend to pick the next person up. Um, you, you can, if you want to know the difference between the two parties, and we, well, you go to the conventions and you, you, it, it takes about a minute. Uh, there tends to be a, uni a uniformity of the complexion of the Republicans, which is not true among Democrats. There tends to be much more hairspray. Um, there tends to be, uh, don't take this personally, among the, among the women delegates, more use of foundation garments. Um, uh, but the other thing is that when the chairman says, will the delegates please take their seats, they do. <laughs> this is unheard of at the Democratic Convention. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the whole point about this is that, is that the only way this time that John McCain could have won was the desire for change. Because unlike past years, when the Republicans have said, I'm sorry, Ronald Reagan, you've got to wait for Jerry Ford. I'm sorry, George Bush, you've got to wait for Ronald Reagan. I'm sorry, Bob Dole, you've got to wait for George Bush. There was nobody next in line. There was one, actually, if you, want, if you like your irony, served up uh, hot and spicy the most perfect Republican candidate for president this year, a two-term governor of the biggest competitive state in the country, a social conservative that moderates like a Catholic, Republicans have never had a Catholic presidential nominee, was sitting there waiting, except that his name was Jeb Bush. And there was no way the Republicans were gonna nominate Jeb Bush, you know, for either slot. So that's, that's what happened with McCain. Um, a man left for dead last summer, with no money, no staff, 5% in the polls. The straight talk express he took in New Hampshire was like a bad greyhound. I mean, he had no, he had no money running on fumes and managed to be the nominee. Uh, something, by the way, that the polls of a year ago would have said was absolutely impossible. So, okay, 
Now look at the Democrats and watch what change, watch the role change played in that election. Uh, if, if you ask somebody in the abstract, uh, all right, here are the two leading candidates. I've got um, a six-year veteran of the Senate who spent eight years in a significant policy-making role in the White House, um, very well-known, um, linked to the only two-term Democrats since FDR with massive fundraising ability. Uh, and then I've got a first-term senator who nobody knows with a name that sounds like the amalgamation of two of the least liked people in the United States. Um, oh, by the way, did I mention that he's African-American? Um, and a guy whose background is as different as we've ever seen. Those are the two candidates. Who would you generally think would be favored? Well, that's why everybody was about to have a coronation for Senator Clinton, who, by the way, as the first plausible woman candidate, from her campaign's point of view, seemed to answer the change desire. How can she not be a change candidate if it's the first woman, plausible woman, to be running? Well, here's the answer. If your last name is Clinton, you're not the change candidate. You may be many other things. You may remind a lot of Democrats of the electoral success of Bill Clinton, that it was an economically good time. But in, in a country where 75% or more of people said they want things different, things are on the wrong track, that was the opening for Barack Obama to do what I have called in a widely unread book, uh, which somebody <laughs> actually has here, not that one, that was widely read, um, which I've called political judo, where you take a weakness and it becomes a strength. Uh, Ross Perot in 1992 showed, was the best example, where he was asked if he'd had any, what about the fact that he had no experience? And Ross Perot at debate said, that's right. I've had no experience running up a $5 trillion debt. <laughs> and in Obama's case, his whole argument of it's time to turn the page resonated. And it meant that all of, of Senator Clinton's arguments about experience which, uh, you know, in a purely objective way were right. I mean, she's had more experience. It, it was not only not relevant to a lot of voters, it was a, it was a liability. Um, now, as I'll mention in a bit, that's causing Obama some problems right now as he tries to make a general election argument. But when Barack Obama was saying, I'm tired of political arguments that started as dorm room debates in the 1960s, he was saying enough already with the baby boomers. You know, we, we, enough with the Woodstock reunions, and enough with the, it was a time of hate, it was a time of love, and enough with the, you know, the song for what it's worth by the Buffalo Springfield. Stop it already. We need to move on. And in, in, a, in a country that saw change, that worked just enough. It's also true, in my view, and by the way, just for any of you who have uh, the willies about this, I want, I'm going to be talking as honestly as I know how about race because because it's on the, if it ever was off the table in America, and it hasn't been for about 350 years, it is sure as heck on the table now. One of the advantages Barack Obama had was the fact that his newness, his unfamiliarity, and the fact that he was an African American who, who was of a different generation than the Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, Charlie Rangel African Americans really, really helped reinforce it that this was change. Now, it didn't hurt that he was, I'm laughing because, you know, the cliche of well-spoken, no. He's about as eloquent a political figure as we've had in about 30 or 40 years. But that all was part of the package. But before I leave the primaries, because this has resonance for now, you need to remember something that I think we did, a, we did not a great job in communicating, much as Lord knows I tried. And that is, this was a razor-thin nomination. We have never had a candidate of either party since the dawn of the primary system, which is essentially 1972, when, it really, when all the power was turned over to voters, that has performed as weakly as Barack Obama. Now again, you may like that, you may not like that. I'm telling you what the facts are. We've never had in either party a candidate who lost as many big states as Barack Obama did. And my feeling is had Michigan and Florida not rush to the front, they first of all, they would have been more important. And my guess is my not, my guess, I'm sure Hillary Clinton would have won Florida, and I don't know how Michigan would have worked out. So outside of Georgia and Illinois, there were no big states, primary states that Obama won. Obama won this nomination 
first of all, by, have, by raising a ton more money because he understood the new, the new technologies, and by, and by understanding the rules of the game. And I'm, I'm stressing this, I'm going back because I don't think you can understand the problems that Obama's having right now without seeing this. Republicans, when they do their convention allocation, they do it like a poker hand. If you win the hand, you win, if you win the pot, you win almost all the money. They have winner-take-all states in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Minnesota, and several others. Democrats divide up their delegates like a kid's birthday party cake. <laughs> where everybody has to get as equal a share as humanly possible. So that under democratic rules, if uh, you're, in a, you're running a congressional district with four delegates and I get 60% of the vote and you get 40% of the vote, I get two delegates, you get two delegates. What the Obama campaign realized was the way to accumulate delegates is to focus on those small caucus states and run up landslides. This state is unique, by the way, because he won a huge landslide in a populous state, and he did it in Illinois too. But everything you have to know about what I'm trying to describe, everything, almost everything, is, is contained in the following bit of intelligence. Barack Obama netted more delegates by winning the Kansas and Idaho caucuses than Hillary Clinton netted winning the Ohio and Pennsylvania primaries. Now, I have been to Kansas. I believe there are people in Idaho. I, haven't, I have no direct proof of this. <laughs> other than Senator Larry Craig, actually. Um, <laughs> it's a whole other story. But that's, that's what happened. I mean, if Hillary Clinton had done better in North Carolina and better in Indiana, we would have had a contested convention. And what pushed Barack Obama over the top was enough people arguing that change was necessary, plus gaming the system. Um, the other thing that I should mention about Obama, which was a real eye-opener, were the number of prominent Democrats from red and swing states that endorsed Obama, even after he lost New Hampshire. Uh, that's a, something I never would have predicted. And a lot of women, too. I mean, Janet Napolitano, the governor of Arizona, Claire McCaskill, the senator from Missouri, Kathleen Sebelius, the governor of Kansas, um, I think Jennifer Granham. I won't swear to that. I think so. I don't know about that. But you know, along with a lot of other guys, said, yeah, we think he's the right way to go. Because they were, make, they were, they were feeling that that's where the country went. And that's, that's what brought us to the conventions. But there's one more thing about change. It explains, in fact, it is the only explanation, not just for the pick of Governor Palin, but for the astonishing impact it's had. It seems to be, based on some pretty good re reporting from one of CBS's better folks on this, that the McCain campaign looked at the Democratic Convention and said, all right, they did what they had to do. And what they learned from the Clinton experience was that experience was not going to work as an issue. Uh, it, it, she had tried it. it. It was only when Clinton changed her argument from experience to I'm the fighter for things you need to fight for that she began running up primary victories. But experience in a country, country where three quarters of the country or more want change, that doesn't cut it. And so they realized, okay, McCain's been in the Senate 26 years. He's met a lot of leaders. He, you know, Obama's a new kid on the block, uh, only been there a couple of years. It's not gonna mean, mean anything to voters. So what we have to do is two things. We have to seize the mantle of change. We have to make our conservative base happy, which is why they didn't pick Joe Lieberman, who McCain would have preferred. But you know, a pro-choice, pro-gay rights, pro-gun control, pro-labor Democrat running as the Republican candidate, <laughs> it would have been great for my business because we'd have had a walkout at the Republican convention or a floor <laughs> fight. You know? But, but if you, when you take away for that, they knew they couldn't do it. So they, we, you know, it seemed very clear up till the day before they were going to pick Governor Pawlenty of Minnesota on a first do no harm principle, you know, nice governor, conservative, moderate, might put Minnesota in play. And the more they thought about it, apparently, the more they realized that's not gonna do it for us. We've got to have someone here who absolutely clearly symbolizes change and reinforces McCain's sense of himself as the Teddy Roosevelt, the renegade, the guy who takes on other Republicans. So, and by the way, I think they were smart enough to say, well, if we pick Sarah Palin and they go after her on experience, aren't they in a sense saying something about their presidential candidate? 
you know, on, on the you can have it both ways. Okay, that explains the pick. But never have I seen a vice presidential pick change the nature of a campaign for the better. We have had examples on the other side. When George McGovern picked Tom Eagleton in 1972, and he then was forced to acknowledge that he'd been hospitalized for depression and had gone through shock treatments, and McGovern, <laughs> thus leading to some friend of mine's slogan, Volt for Eagleton. <laughs> Cruel but funny. Uh, and they had to drop him from the ticket. That was not good. The reason I'm a trained professional analyst is I can figure this out. You young people, <laughs> might take you years more to figure out that when you have to throw your vice president off the ticket, not so good. Uh, Dan Quayle. Uh, not so good. Experienced, four years in the House, eight years in the Senate, but was not ready for the main stage. Geraldine Ferraro, first woman pick. Her husband's real estate dealings proved to be embarrassing. Spiro Agnew in 1968, who, by the way, has exactly the same experiential level as Sarah Palin. County, you know, local county executive instead of a mayor and a year and a half as governor. By the end of that campaign, the Democrats were running ads showing a sign that said Spiro Agnew for president and a, a voiceover of a man laughing hysterically. <laughs> and the slogan was, if it wasn't so serious, it would be funny. This is different. This changed the game. And, and I want to suggest why, but this is something I think my friends of the liberal persuasion simply don't get. They look at Sarah Palin, they say, extremist on abortion, uh, she believes in, she wants creationism taught. I mean, she, she thinks she's a foreign policy expert because Alaska board is Russia, <laughs> which, by the way, is a silly argument, and I think you're not going to hear much more of it. They don't understand the impact that she had. And the way you understand this, in my view, is to understand the degree to which voters make choices based as much on instinct and visceral response as they do, forgive me, League of Women Voters, by sitting down and reading through 45-page analyses of, uh, of you know, water right policy. That's just not how it happens. And it never has, by the way, except for a few. So, what a, so here's what I mean. And remember the change mantra. This election has been going on, it seems like about 30 years, but it's been going on for real for almost two years. And these people, not just McCain, who's been around forever, but Obama, are now, are now more than familiar figures. We've seen them every day. So suddenly there's this new person from a place that we haven't seen political leaders picked, not just her gender, not just the fact that she is a, a kind of classic, iconic small town gal, but that she is a, she resonates with a very traditional American cultural preference for the, the common sense, plain spoken, regular Joe or Jill who vanquishes the condescending stuffed shirt elitists like people who work for network television. Um, if anybody here ever saw the movie Aaron Brockovich, or Norma Ray, or Nine to Five, or for the more seniors in here, the Solid Gold Cadillac, it's the same story. It's just that when Hollywood writes the story, because all, all the Hollywood writers are liberals, um, the heroines are always on the left. Well, this is a right-wing version of that. Somebody who comes from a place where, where, where people who have never seen themselves in, in this stage say, oh, I know her. You know, she and her husband run the local stationery store or the gas station. In fact, her sister and brother-in-law. And, and she's, she's, she's a conservative, but she's no Grant Wood American Gothic submissive lady. You know, somebody who walks around with a rifle um, is, is, and, f you know, f field dresses a moose. This is not a shrinking violet. And that's why this this pick has had such power, in my view. Now, please don't misunderstand. We've got seven weeks to go. She may well, the, we, we have such a fast processing of information in this country that in three weeks she may be old news. More to the point, it may be that the bloom will be off the rose. We've already seen that the claim of, uh, her claims to be the anti-earmarking governor are, are questionable. Um, but that's what's happened here, and it, it's related to change. So. I think that's where we are now. Um, I'm, I'm going to quickly move to the end because we're going to have plenty of time and questions to deal with whatever you want. When you look at this, one of the things she has done is to, is to undraw the new electoral map that Kenny was talking about. A lot of states that the Obama people thought were in play, at least as of now, appear not to be. Uh, Alaska actually looked like a shot 
because of all the corruption with the Republican Party. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. The last number I saw has the McCain ticket leading there by about 40 points. But beyond that, places like Montana, uh, which were really in play, may not be. Um, it, I think here in the South, um, Georgia, where 75 Obama staffers have been pulled out, doesn't look like it's in contention. And it's going to give the Obama campaign a lot of problems in places like Pennsylvania and Michigan, where there are a lot of rural, small town, conservative Democrats. Um, footnote about Pennsylvania, which was the state that Bush wanted to carry, wanted to take away from the Democrats more than any other and came very close twice. Pennsylvania is the only, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, Pennsylvania is the only state in the country whose two senators are a pro-life Democrat and a pro-choice Republican. Uh, that's kind of interesting. And it's an it's a area of vulnerability for Democrats because a lot of those Democrats are culturally, particularly between Philadelphia and James Carville once said that Pennsylvania is Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Alabama in the middle. Uh, <laughs> this is... This is typical Carvelian exaggeration, but you get the point. Um, so there, a lot of these states now look dicey. I mean, Minnesota is up for grabs. There are, there are a number of states where the Democrats have to be holding their breath. But one way to look at this, um, and then I will finish, is there are two, remember Donald Rumsfeld said there are knowns, there are known unknowns, and then there are unknown unknowns. Well, the two unknown unknowns here, are race and ute. My cousin Vinny is one of my favorite movies. And I, <laughs> ever since I saw that movie, I can't say youths. I have to say utes. Um, but they're the great unknowns. Uh, the race is obvious. Um, there, are, there are plenty of people who worry about the so-called Bradley effect, named after Mayor of Los Angeles, Tom Bradley, who was well ahead in the polls, running for governor of California in 82 and lost. And the belief was that Voters simply weren't prepared to tell pollsters, I'm not voting for the black guy. Um, that's, that's been out there as a potential fear for a while. Uh, it did not happen with Harold Ford Jr. in 06 in Tennessee. He lost by about the same margin he was trailing in the polls. But it's clearly, I mean, talk about an unknown unknown, we just don't know. And among some Democrats, there is this concern that whatever people say, um, they're not going to pull the lever. I, I'm, I'm an agnostic on this. I simply don't know. Um, it also seems to me that the potential for an increased African-American turnout, uh, given the machinery of the Obama campaign, is something on the other side. And I, I do want to mention this. Um, this one is really at the heart of, of what we're, we're grappling with. And it's very tricky stuff. It seems to me that race alone doesn't explain the hesitancy about Barack Obama. Because the way to imagine this is imagine there were a Democratic version of Colin Powell, who was the Democratic nominee for president, without Iraq hanging over him. None of the attacks on Obama would have made any sense. His celebrity, uh, no, a guy spent his life in the service of his country. He almost died for his country. Seems strange, doesn't share our values. You know what? A, a, a multi-star general who heads the National Security Council, you're, you're not going to, that's not going to work, particularly not with conservatives. So the only, in that, if there were a controlled experiment, if there were another planet where you could run Colin Powell as the Democratic nominee, you would know. Because, because there, the only, the only argument is not, uh, I don't trust his values, uh, what was he doing with Jeremiah Wright? It would have been, he's black. On the other hand, on the other hand, Race informs our views sometimes of other things. There's a social psychology experiment I just read about, which I'd never heard of, and I should have. They take two groups of whites, put them in separate rooms, and they give them a job application. It's the same, word for word. Same education, same experience, same references. It's just that one of them has a picture of a black applicant, and the other has a picture of a white applicant. And pretty much uniformly, the white respondents say that the black applicant is less experienced. Now, what's that about? The same, uh, by the way, experiment has been done politically, where people have given a position paper of two candidates. It's the same, same deal. And they've felt that the black candidate was more liberal. So they are using, people do use race to inform them. I don't know how that's going to play out this time. Uh, and by the way, just for the record, I think you know, some of the questions about Obama like his 21-year association with Jeremiah Wright, I've had lots of conversations with this, 
with uh, African American friends of mine, but you know, that's a question that, that is going to linger on people's minds. In the same sense, I think that if John McCain has spent 21 years with a, one of those ministers who thinks the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon, he'd had some questions to answer. Anyway, that's, but here's the other one, Utes. Um, we've been waiting since 1972 for you folks to show up at the polls. Now, I, I don't mean you folks. I mean, under, I mean young people. You know, you, I don't sure. Are there anyone here 18 to 21? Okay. Well, you guys, because you were six, or you weren't born when this was, <laughs> now that I think about it. But, but people have been waiting for this, and young voters just haven't shown up. It's like waiting for Godot. You know, and maybe he'll show up tomorrow, next time. Um, this time, in the primary, they began to show up in 04. It was an uptick, but there was an uptick of everybody. They really showed up in the primaries, in the Democratic primaries. And if the Obama campaign, in fact, can take all this vaunted machinery, um, the Facebooks and the MySpace and the social networks, and and face-to-face -face organizing, they're actually taking a leaf from the Bush campaign of 04, and pull young voters to the polls, it means that all of these poll numbers are skewed. They're not reflecting the real voters. In addition to which, let me try something. Um, this, among the younger folks here, you know who you are. Uh, how, many, how many of you do not have a landline, have only a cell phone? Yeah. It turns out, according to the Kennedy Institute of Politics that's been researching this, that something on the order of half of Americans under the age of 30 don't have landlines. Pollsters can't call these people. They're not allowed to. And we've been told by these pollsters, oh, they're, people without landlines are just like everybody else. Well, the Kennedy Institute says, no, they're not. They're particularly more liberal on, on international matters and environmental matters. And so we don't know whether if this cohort shows up, if, if the numbers we're looking at now are wrong. So I'll take one minute to talk about after, because I think it's, it's pretty telling. Um, the best, one of the best movies about politics ever made was The Candidate the 1972 movie with Robert Redford as an idealistic candidate for senator who kind of gets caught up and compromises. The movie ends with him getting elected, and there's a big party. And he, he's sitting there by himself, and he's looking at the James Carville, Carl Rove, whoever it is figure who has engineered the election. I think Peter Boyle played him. And he mouths to him, what do I do now? <laughs> And the guy kind of does the Reagan at the helicopter thing. He doesn't hear him. And, and Redford says, what do I do now? And the guy, Peter Boyle, shrugs, and then the movie ends. Well, that's a reasonably interesting question for either of these candidates. Uh, first, because politically, it seems to me pretty obvious that absent a huge sea change of, of attitude, the answer is, it doesn't matter what you want to do, because the political system doesn't permit it. If John McCain is elected president, now his supporters love the idea and uh, his detractors or some of them hate the idea that he thinks Roe v. Wade should be overturned. And he wants justices like Scalia and I guess Thomas and Roberts. The Senate, unless we're completely crazy, is going to be a little more democratic than it is now. Maybe 53, 54 Democrats and a few pro-choice Republican senators. He's not going to get those guys through the, and ladies through the Congress. There's no way. He's going to have to compromise with the Democrats who run things. Uh, he's going to extend the Bush tax cuts in a, in a more Democratic House and Senate than now? No, he's not. As far as Obama goes, uh, the way things work now in the Senate, you need 60 votes in the Senate to pass anything. Uh, you're going to get in, in, a, in a year when the government says we're going to have a, maybe a half a trillion dollar deficit, you're going to get huge new spending programs for things like a, a, an expanded health care system? I don't think so. Um, and none of this, by the way, takes into account the fact that we may be in a financial situation that is much more precarious and threatening than it is now. With entitlement programs, you folks of the college age will be happy to know that you may be spending your working life supporting the largest cohort of freeloaders in American <laughs> history. That would be people like me. Um, there are more people of my age and baby boomer age who will be eligible for Medicare and Social Security uh, than ever, and there will be fewer of you. The numbers don't look good because we vote more than you do. And I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the, if the our notion is, well, you know, you're young, you can work an extra 
four hours a day to pay the Social Security taxes, then that'll help keep me alive and healthy and frisky in my, in my 80s and 90s. That may be what we're heading toward. And my point, as I finish, is that's just one example of some genuinely daunting stuff. And if the political system that we are seeing, as now in full, in full flower this campaign, doesn't begin to face the fact that these are serious matters that cannot be solved with attitude posturing and 30-second television ads, that everybody in this system is going to have to give up a lot of their cherished beliefs and assumptions in order to fix this. If we can't get to that point, um, my hunch is that the next president will leave the inaugural stand, go to the Oval Office, read the first memo, and demand a recount. <laughs>Is it possible to ask more than one question? After, I'll show you how you get to do coup questions when you're not allowed. <laughs> I feel that race is a very important issue, but do you think that Obama is limiting himself by not making race an issue? I think Obama represents another generation of African-American political leaders, uh, and he's not the only one. Um, there's a congressman from Alabama named Arthur, and that's how it's not Arthur, it's Arthur Davis, who is a, actually a Democrat, but he's a kind of socially conservative. He's actually talking about running for governor of Alabama. Uh, Harold Ford Jr., um, the former congressman from, from uh, New York, who's also the senior pastor, a pastor emeritus of the largest African-American church in the borough of Queens, Floyd Flake. These are, these are black politicians who explicitly reject the model of, ja of, of, let's say, Jesse Jackson and Charlie Rangel and much of the older Black Caucus. That is, they, they are more entrepreneurial, they are less entranced with government programs, and they, they are particularly distant from the grievance model of somebody like Jackson. Um, look, I, 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 one of the things that Obama said during one of the debates was somebody asked him, you know, people say you're not black enough. And he said, well, you know, when I'm trying to catch a cab, uh, you know, and down in New York, maybe you'd have a different opinion. I, I don't think he's making a mistake. I think he made, he made that one speech um, after the Reverend Wright controversy blew up that was a pretty impressive analysis of what was going on. But it's not as though he has a, look, he has no choice, as he points out, this is, you know, he's an African-American or, but I, th the racism, you know, the racism issue, let me just give you one little bit of history. And if this sounds too Pollyannish, I apologize. You need to see what this country was like in 1948. I'm, I'm, I'm measuring this with the end of World War, 1945, the end of World War II to understand what it is to be in, a, in an authentically racist country. I mean, I, I spent some time in South Africa, uh, you know, <laughs> that's a whole other story. We're talking about a country where at the outbreak of World War II, one of the leading defense industry CEOs said, there aren't gonna be any jobs for Negroes here, that's the term of art back then. Maybe as, maybe as uh, floor sweepers, but that's all. Uh, in New York, Adam Clayton Powell, who became a legendary congressman. His first political action, just before World War II, was to lead protests against department stores like Macy's that would not hire black salespeople. The nations, I'm, I'm sure, I hope you all know this, I'm talking to younger folks, that the second school desegregation case was in Washington, D.C. The schools in the nation's capital were racially segregated. Um, now, and never mind, by the way, the, the, you know, where you saw uh, blacks in mass media, what roles they had. Um, this is a different country. Um, I, don't think it, I don't think it's insignificant that where Walter Cronkite was once the most trusted figure in American media, now, by far, the most trusted figure in American media is Oprah Winfrey. She may have lost some of this because she came out for Obama and you know, breached partisanship. 
which is not to say, do I, does this mean that racism has disappeared? As, of course it doesn't. I mean, you'd have to be an idiot to think that. Um, and it may well be, look, I think, it, I think we may yet come to it, we may yet find that Obama, if he loses, lost because there was a, a, enough, a certain number of whites that simply would not vote for him because of his color. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm trying to see the funny thing about this is I remember I had this conversation in, in Iowa about a week before the caucuses with a, a bunch of us CBS people were gathered around uh, three or four of, of the correspondents and producers were, were African American and they just they, it simply was beyond they just said I just don't think at the end of the day these white folks here in Iowa are going to vote for Barack Obama um, now there's an irony here. It may be that one of the reasons why racism didn't play a role in Iowa is there are very few blacks, and so there's no history of racial conflict in Iowa. And there, that's, I'm being very realistic with you, with you folks, because that's an issue. But uh, this is a long-winded answer, and I apologize. So I think Obama, because his whole persona is, I am from a different place than these other earlier generation. Uh, d d you know, it isn't, it isn't, who he is to make race the center. His argument has to be for, to get 60 million Americans to vote for him on the grounds that he represents something that, that means something to them. And, you know, one last point, because you might find this interesting, I hope you do. The night he was nominated was, the, as you might know, the 45th anniversary of Martin Luther King's speech. And I actually said on the air that I thought that the Obama campaign would have been that this wasn't necessarily what, what they wanted. They didn't want this to be the celebration of, the first, of, of blackness, of a black person winning the nomination. His race is obvious. Uh, in fact, because I tend to be flip, I said to somebody it would have been much better politically for Obama if this were the 80th anniversary of the post office uprising in Dublin so that you know, he could say something about Irish Americans. Um, but is, look, it's going to be there. It's not even an elephant in the room. It's beyond that. And we're going to find out November 4th where we are now. It's your turn. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just make sure you get back to your second question. Um, your comments about the Senator, Senator Biden, and uh, if any, and um, how, when at the end of the day, when people vote, how significant will it be who the vice president candidate is in terms of them actually pu pulling a lever one way or another? Uh, now, you see, that's how you get two questions right. in. <laughs> It sounds like one question, but it isn't. So that's, see? Okay, now. Um, you know, uh, Biden is, um, I followed him around some during the pres this presidential campaign. I was very impressed by him because except for occasional moments, he was able to rein in that, that impulse of his to talk at endless length. And he was being very, he was going into groups of like 60 and 70 Iowans in the back room of, some, of a restaurant and talking very seriously about Iraq. And there's no doubt that, that he knows this turf. Politically, he's, he's, I, think he's, I think the debate is a potential real trap for Joe Biden. Because, and I, believe me, as it takes one to know one. Joe Biden's a smart aleck. Uh, there's another way to put that, but I thought I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> He loves a wisecrack. He's a very funny guy, and he can't help it. I mean, you, can, you watch the twinkle in his eye, uh, and all he has to do is one kind of condescending, smart aleck remark about Sarah Palin, uh, and that debate's over. Um, now, you know, I also think he's a very impressive guy in a lot of ways, and, and um, Makes the, makes the, because he served with John McCain in the Senate for 26 years, he actually makes a, a politically effective case. At the end of the day, it's, the general rule is people don't vote for vice presidents. I mean, I don't know, some political scientists, and boy, there's a contradiction in terms. Um, <laughs> I guess it ain't a science, whatever it is. But anyway, a couple of them years ago tried to calculate this. They thought that Quayle had cost Bush a point or two. Uh, clearly, Lyndon Johnson made the difference in John Kennedy by delivering Texas and probably a couple of other southern states, without which he wouldn't be the president. Um, but I, what I think it's fair to say is if, there, if there's no change in the narrative um, and McCain wins, it's going to be because of this. Th this is going to be the single biggest reason, because it did, as I try to describe, change it so much, you know? So.
home values have fallen 15% nationally more elsewhere. My sense is that the voters have not yet caught up to the fact that this looks a lot like 1929 and that the presidential candidates are responding to the voters and they have not caught up. What's, what's your thought? Is it 1929? Are we paying attention? Well, it's not, it isn't 1929 because Main Street, average Americans are not going to, they, they know or should know that most of the savings accounts are, are, total, are safe. I mean, you know, if you're $100,000, you're insured. Um, and you've got a Fed that, that is perfectly willing to step in, which did not happen then. But, uh, but uh, let me, if you want to not sleep tonight, <laughs> let me cite you a, a, a magazine piece that I read, reread every six months. It came out three years ago. Uh, in the Atlantic, a, a one Google search will get it for you. The, the magazine article is called Countdown to a Meltdown. Countdown to a Meltdown by Jim, James Fallows, one of our best journalists. And it's set in 2016. It's a memo to the incoming president explaining how we got to where he thinks we got, you know, where things are awful. And the chilling part about the uh, article is that everything that he describes happening in the years following in the future were already in place. And I asked him a few months ago whether he saw more signs of this, and he said, I'm afraid I do. So that's partly what I meant. I'm not an economist. Um, I'm, I can't take you, I don't have the time to take you through the worst case scenario. But I, but I think we're in a, a pretty serious pickle. Um, and what I actually wonder at, at times is you take that, and then you take something that I didn't talk about in the speech because I didn't want to go on too long, which is the emergence of, of uh, China and Russia, and to some extent Brazil and India, as real competitors. I mean, China's buying up every commodity there is in the world to try to get to a higher standard of living. And that means that there's a certain limit to what any public policy can do. Uh, and then you add to that the fact, in my view, the fact that, for instance, on the environment and energy, the thing you most want is 6 and $7 a gallon gasoline. And trust me, you're not going to hear a candidate for president talk about that one. Um, that we're we're in a we're in a very serious condition. To just you know roll the tape back eight years, and the big debate in the 2000 campaign was what were we going to do with the 5.6 trillion dollar surpluses that we're heading in the next decade? Well, you know that that's be kind of nice to have that debate as opposed to now. So I, I think stuff I think structurally we're in a very <coughs> tough time. Now, you had a question. Okay. Yeah. Are you concerned with fraud in this election? Because there's a lot of talk of uh, fraudulent machines and fraud in the 2000 and 2004 election, right. which were okay. very close. Well, you might as well know where I stand on this. The 2004 election, I think, um, was largely not fraud. For one thing, Bush, let's remember, that question, forgive me, tends to come from people on the Democratic side of things. I don't know. I've just taken a wild hunch here. <laughs> but in 2004, Bush got 3 million more votes than Kerry, unlike 2000. And it would have been a weird twist of fate if Ohio had delivered the presidency to Kerry having 3 million fewer votes. I think that's not what happened in Ohio. I think what happened was that the Bush folks, uh, and you can read a book called Applebee's America to see how they did it, micro-targeted in Ohio brilliantly. and and you know, just did a better job. 2000's a much trickier case. I wrote a, another widely unread book about that <laughs> called Waiter on One Order of Crow, which is what I said election night the first time we'd screwed up. Um, but what I'm worried about much more than fraud, first of all, you should be happy to know that in all those states that you were worried about, the Democrats are now running things. So you might want to root for fraud. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know, but you know, I mean, Ohio is a, it's all Democrats now, and uh, Florida, no, Florida's still Republican. Um, Pennsylvania, you know, all the competitive states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, Illinois, well, no, Illinois is safe, Ohio is, um, yeah, they're mostly, you know, Montana. These competitive battleground states, Virginia, are all Democrats. I'm worried about incompetence. I'm worried about, you know, n never, un Never assume a conspiracy when incompetence and screw-ups will do. That's a rule of life I have. And that I am worried about. I mean, it turns out, believe it or not, that they had a judicial election in, are you ready for this, Palm Beach County, where 3,000 ballots went missing. <laughs> By the way, a solidly Democratic county. 
I just want to point that out. Yeah, am I worried that these machines are going to screw up? Am I worried about a close election where we don't know who the president is? Are we worried about one candidate winning the popular vote and the other winning the electoral vote? You bet I am. Fraud, not so much. Oh, this, there's a question over here. My question has to do with the influence of rhetoric in, in this election. And um, it seems, though, that there seems to be kind of a pushback against kind of those grand professorial kind of talks that Barack Obama gave. And I wanted to ask you, as you know, a former speechwriter, um, why is it that, that you think that's happening? I like that question. I do. Um, yeah, I am a, I'm a retired speechwriter, or at least retired writing other people's speeches. And I care about rhetoric, and I care about eloquence. And I do think, here's what I think about this. Um, Obama. Obama's political career, if you think about it, and presidential prospects are built to a large extent on three speeches. His speech he gave four years ago at the Democratic Convention, when he was still a state senator, which suddenly had everybody asking, who is this? Uh, the speech he gave at the Jefferson Jackson Day dinner in the fall of 2007, when he was well behind in the polls, and just blew everybody else, including Hillary Clinton, away. And the speech he gave the night he won the Iowa caucuses, which actually sounded like an inaugural speech. But you're on to something here. And I think the, I think the pushback is because um, there is not a lot of stuff we know about Barack Obama as a, as a doer. You know, he came to the Senate in 2000, early 2005. You, you, you know, now, other freshman senators to, you know, have come with presidential aspirations, but it doesn't make any sense to compare them. You can't compare Robert Kennedy, who had been the second most powerful person in America for three years as attorney general with his brother, and that comparison doesn't work. So what happened, and I think it particularly started happening in the middle of the primaries and really kicked in after that speech he gave um, in Berlin, where people were saying, wait a minute, what is this? Uh, the, of, all, of all the speeches he gave, the line where I, if he had one line, I know, I don't know, but I'm guessing he'd like to take back. It's the night he clinched the nomination and he said, let this be the moment when the seas ceased rising. And it gave the McCain people that opportunity to do that very funny ad where we saw Charlton Heston from the Ten Commandments, you know, parting the Red Sea. I mean, you're setting yourself up for that. And I think, in fact, one of the reasons why his later primaries weren't successful, and the, I think the Obama people, I know they think this, is there was a time after that where the speeches needed to be brought down and instead of talking to 30,000 people in a, in a hall, he needed to be, you know, face to face. Um, that said, the idea that, that eloquence uh, it w has come back as, a, as a, uh, an attribute pleases me. And we've had, you know, we should remember that, that um, Bill Clinton, who was off the cuff as mesmerizing a speaker as ever, never gave a great speech. His inaugural speeches are kind of indifferent. It's when he, when he got rid of the text and started talking to the audience the way he did in Memphis to those black ministers, that amazing speech in 93 when he said if Martin Luther King came back, he'd say, I did not live and die so 13-year-olds would kill 10-year-olds for their jackets. I mean, that's one of the most amazing, but it's all off the cuff. Uh, and nobody ever accused the first Bush or the second Bush of, of eloquence, although, the single best convention speech, I think, in terms of political effectiveness, was George H.W. Bush's speech in 88. It's an absolutely brilliant piece of work. So I'm glad it came back, but I do think you're quite right that there has been a pushback, and you see where that benefits McCain. I mean, now we're back to popular culture. Now we're back to the professor versus the fighter pilot. Now we're, now we're the, the quiet, you know, the Virginian, the quiet guy. The Gary Cooper guy. I ain't much for fancy language, but by God, I give my man a word. You know, it's that stuff that um, that you know Americans kind of don't always trust eloquence. So, uh, thank you for the question. Let's go here. Um, I was intrigued by your comment about people choosing their candidates or who they support by their gut, or just a visceral thing, and it frightens me that we. Um, that um, on one side, we've got somebody who was a cut up in school, didn't do well, the fighter pilot guy, and then somebody that took five or six years to get through a, or, and change schools repeatedly. Why is there such anti-intellectualism here in America? Well, 
okay. Um, <laughs> let me put you down as undecided as well, okay? <laughs> Part of this, I think, I, I'm, this may seem to you that I'm you know, off in the stratosphere, but I really have thought on, an awful lot about this. Um, part of it is so rooted in the American sense of ourselves. Um, we, we broke away from Europe. We broke away from caste. We broke away from aristocracy. And you go all the way back to Jefferson, you go back to Crevcourt's letter from an American farmer, you read the compulsory Tocqueville, and it's all about America as a place where sort of common sense values and folks and practicality rule and work. The first great democratic president, after all, was Andrew Jackson, who celebrated the fact that he was a backwoodsman and a military guy. Uh, you know, his inaugural is famous for being, you know, a, a it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like um, a rave. <laughs> the, the White House was kind of almost demolished by his supporters because we like that. We, we, and, by the way, um, you know, as somebody who has the requisite number of degrees, I'm absolutely not convinced that that is necessarily a sign of presidential effectiveness. The last president we had who didn't go to college and was met, mocked for that was a guy named Harry Truman who, you know, it turned out, uh, now, he was also a self-educated man who read a lot. And I don't think anybody's accused the current occupant of the White House of that. <laughs> um, on the other hand, this guy has a, both a Harvard and a Yale degree. Um, you know, it's a famous line, but when Franklin Roosevelt was running, Oliver Wendell Holmes said about him, second-rate intellect, first-rate temperament. And my feeling is that that, you know, if, as, that's the right, that's what matters most. Um, you know, Woodrow Wilson was a college president, not a particularly great success as a president. Um, and as to the other part, look, I think obviously you can take this to the other extreme. I mean, we, you know, the idea that um, I can remember what was really telling to me, it was a press conference that President Bush had with, um, it must have been Chirac, I guess. Uh, and was it Chirac? I think so. <laughs> And David Gregory, I think, got up and asked Bush a question, and then asked a question of the of Chirac in French. And Bush went nuts. He said, oh, <laughs> fancy Dan, you know, he had a year of French. And it was obviously, you know, he, this guy was not comfortable with this. You know, in Europe, foreign correspondents ask American presidents questions in English all the time. But, but to get back to your point, I think this is a longstanding fundamental sense that we don't trust fancy talkers. We trust doers. Uh, now, does this make sense? Do you, does, it, does it offend those of us who actually, you know, think book learning is good? But it's there. My question is a uh, economic slash class question. Uh, I have a problem. I'm having a hard time grasping the whole idea of uh, capitalism and how our economy works. So. Uh, with what well, we have, a bottom-up approach on one side, and, and then the other side we have the top-down juggernaut. Uh, my question to you, or what I'd like you to talk about, is how is it possible for John Poorman to possibly uh, die in a different class than he was born in with respect to this election that we find ourselves in? It's an intriguing question. Um, uh, I'll tell you a quick story that may, I hope, help. Um, when George McGovern was running for president, he proposed a very, very high tax on very wealthy people, an inheritance tax, saying, you know, we should, we should recover some of this money and put people closer to the starting line. And the, when he was campaigning in New Hampshire in shoe factories, which were then a big deal in New Hampshire, they are not anymore, he found enormous pushback from this on the part of these workers. And, and the McGovern campaign couldn't figure this out. You know, this was a millionaire's tax. And what it was was that the, the, these folks kn knew that they would never get to that place, but they believed their children could. And it's always been a tension in this country's politics. It's why we've never had a, um, a vibrant socialist party, in that the whole American experience of setting out for the frontier, building a new life, um, the immigrant experience, 
uh, the, the pioneer experience, is you can, make, you can make a new life for yourself. We're not bound by the limits of what Europeans felt. If you were born a peasant, you died a peasant. Now, you know, there are times when people have a radically different view of this. In the 30s and 40s and, uh, and 50s, working class people voted overwhelmingly for the Democrats because they'd had the experience of Roosevelt making a difference. Um, and one of the reasons Clinton succeeded uniquely as a president was he actually talked to the middle class in a way that said, you know what, I can make a difference in your lives. I can make it easier for you to get your kids into college. If you're a poor working person, the earned income tax credit will get you better off. And that's always been at the heart of what Democrats have said about the economy. The problem is in recent years, they've been trumped by these other things, values, culture. Are you really one of us? I mean, look. I mean, think about the success of the Republican Party in, in taking two Bushes, um, skull and bones, fourth and fifth generation aristocrats, WASP, uh, you know, House and Kennebunkport, and turning them into regular guys, and turning the son of Greek immigrants, in the case of Michael Dukakis, into an elitist. And the reason they've been able to do that, by the way, is that there's enough there <laughs> in cultural terms to make it work. So the question now is, look, I think if, if this news that this gentleman was alluding to, the financial news, brings people back to a sense of we are in perilous economic times, that has to be better for the Democrats. Because as a general rule, except when Jimmy Carter was in power when things went bad, people when they get in trouble economically think, yeah, I think I know what party is better for me. Um, but just one more point, because you raised a provocative question. Uh, and it goes back to this notion of how come uniquely, in a, in, of all the industrialized countries, this country's never had a socialist party. And some, some writer, I wish I could tell you who, years ago, decades ago, wrote that socialism in America foundered on the shoals of roast beef and apple pie. And what he meant was that unlike in Europe back then, middle class life in America was okay. You know, we, I mean, there was a time when auto workers in, at, at, at the uh, General Motors and Ford plants, they had weekend houses. They weren't mansions. They had, like, cabins up in the north of Wisconsin and in Lake Michigan. Well, you know, and they had second cars. And their kids, there was a feeling that things were going to get constantly better. Uh, we've lost a lot of that. And obviously there were some people in America who never caught up to that. But that's why, I think. That's the best explanation I can have. Man. I know that this um, election is very important in America, but it's also important in the international community. My question is, how much thought do you think Americans will give to the international community's reaction to both candidates on November 4th? May I first say that I'd like to take a lot of you folks with me on every speech I give, because the quality of these questions is breathtaking. That is so... And I'm not pandering because there's not much you can do for me if you think about it. <laughs> um, but here's the point about that. And, and boy, is this, this is striking. Um, there was a time when, in fact, I remember this because it was the first election I really paid attention to. It was in 1960 when the feeling of the international community mattered. John Kennedy, when he ran for president, made a major argument about the fact that there was some international poll that showed Americans had lost prestige in the world. And that this is one reason why he should be elected. And Nixon would say, no, no, it's not true. We really do have prestige. But it mattered. In, in the last couple of elections, and in fact, um, if you would look at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution today and look at a column by Luke Boggs on the op-ed page, and he is arguing in no uncertain terms that we don't give a tinker's damn. It's, no, it's none of their business who we elect. And that it's actually a sign of, it's a liability that the international community wants Barack Obama to win. I'm serious. If, if somebody has the Atlanta Journal-Constitution today, you know, today's, if it's back where you are, make sure you read it because it expresses this point of view perfectly. It's, it's, again, it's this notion, we don't want them fancy, weak need, shabbly drinking, brie-eating, <laughs> escargot-cooking, <laughs> surrendering to the Germans all the time, Europeans, telling us who to vote for. Uh, now, you know, my own, <laughs> my own sense is this, this is one where I, you know, I, I can understand it, but this is where I kind of say, wait a second. You know, we, 
I mean, let, let's assume that there are some substantial things we want from the international community, like helping us defeat Islamic extremists, for instance, who are out to kill as many of us as they can. Wouldn't it be a good idea to have a president that the rest of the world kind of likes and respects? But it's interesting that Obama's not making that argument. And I think he's not making that argument because there is this feeling that if you are popular abroad, something's got to be wrong with you. You're not a real American. It's odd. And by the way, I have a hunch that this is what has got Colin Powell undecided about. You know, he's been very clear about saying, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. It's a lifelong Republican. And my hunch is that the one person in America who could make this argument and actually have some political impact is if Colin Powell were to, were to back Obama and say, you know, I like John McCain, he's an old friend, but we have got to start restoring our standing in the world, and this is the guy who can do it. That might make a difference, because nobody's going to call Colin Powell, you know, a weak-kneed, shabbly, whatever the hell that was. <laughs> uh, but, but that's a really interesting point. So you had a... Do you think that the talk show, the talk shows, <coughs> what is their impact in terms of either shaping the election mm -hmm. or are they merely reflecting back? Yeah. And, and also, can you address the rise of that impact? If, yeah, if it's a very, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating question. Um, Here's the first thing that people should remember about, uh, by talk shows, I think you mean the endless cable conversations about, about the election. Here's something to remember about this. There are 110, roughly, 110 million homes in America with televisions, which is to say just about every home. Uh, some homes have, I don't know how many televisions. The shows you're talking about have audiences in the several hundred thousands. The most popular of all of them is O'Reilly, who has about two and two and a half to three million. Uh, and then, it, then it's a real sharp, you know, Fox gets two to three million in its prime time. CNN, depending on what it does, gets about a million. And MSNBC, you know, gets a little less. Or... So in other words, you're talking about a relative handful of viewers. Um, and this leads to a point I, I want to point to as a possible head scratcher. Uh, the thing is, though, that the politically obsessed community thinks that this matters, in my view, much more than it does. I mean, this 24-hour gab fest, where every poll is like treated like a Martians have landed story. Uh, and oh my god, Obama's, who I actually, uh, McLaughlin Group, which started this nefarious trend toward gas baggery, uh, used to ask every week, who won the week? Well, now, David Gregory's show and Politico.com are asking, who won the day? Um, I don't think that's how people decide who to vote for. I think this is like a, uh, like a wildly misplaced sense of urgency. I think most people aren't watching this stuff. In fact, the thing that I wanted to mention is most people, I think, a lot of people are what are called low information voters who are going to decide either from the gut or from a last minute kind of hunch or something, and they may well decide very late. Um, what, I, what I think is that the political community, including the candidates themselves, have responded to this by feeling they have to be on a, you know, endless schedule. I guarantee you, by the time this talk is over, there will be 30, 50, I don't know how many emails in here from the different campaigns citing every misstatement, every, everything possible about the other candidate to let me and everybody and my colleagues know. And I, you know, that my delete key is wearing out because I don't, you know, I don't care. Um, just as an example, I should share this with you. Um, today, John McCain's top economic advisor was asked well, in all his years in the Senate, uh, you know, what, what, what's, what has his impact been on the economy? And this guy whipped out his Blackberry and said this, because John McCain's d philosophy when he was chairing a government subcommittee opened the door to all this new innovation. Well, the headline is, aid, colon, McCain invented the Blackberry, <laughs> which is now going to bring on his head as much unfair garbage from the, you go home and watch the late night talk shows, folks. I'll, I'll bet many important parts of my body. 
that, that Conan and Leno and Letterman, boy, they're going to be on this big time. Just like Al Gore was tarred with the invented the internet because he said accurately, well, I helped take the initiative. So th this is the sort of stuff, and this will be, I think cable for the next 24 hours will be dominated by McCain invented the BlackBerry. And to me, it's not how, it's not where this comes out. It's one of the reasons I left cable. You know, the great thing about cable was all that time, and the terrible thing about cable was all that time. <laughs> so let me come over. Yeah, I'm going to. Um, I understand. I, I wanted to ask about the transition. Uh, depending on who, what, which candidate wins, um, there's a number of policies going that need to be addressed in a transitional government uh, to make sure we keep continuation going um, and shifting those policies. And who would be in charge? Maybe in you know mm -hmm. DoD over at. Um, okay, I. It's a. The reason that question actually matters, I can't give you the names of, you know, McCain, in fact, both parties have named, both candidates have named their people who will run their transitions. And when Obama did it, the McCain people said this was overreaching, and, and then the McCain people did it because you have to. In fact, um, it makes a big difference because the first year of Clinton's administration was substantially um, hobbled by the fact that he had probably the worst transition uh, in, in memory. You know, largely because it's the way Clinton ran his office. It's the way Clinton ran his life. It was messy and disorganized and, and late and unfocused. Um, but here's what I, here's, I'll, I'll hazard a guess, okay? Hunch. You see, I think, th I think there is a part of jo John McCain, uh, let's just assume for a minute he wins, that really wants to be the John McCain that we remember. You know, he's given this campaign over to some very hardball operators because he wants to win, and he's made his peace with the Republican right. But I think when McCain says that he would have something like a coalition government, I think he means it. And so what would be interesting to see whether or not if McCain wins, if he becomes the prisoner of his party and the demands for, you know, orthodoxies, or whether or not he says, damn it, I'm 72 years old. I've spent 10 years trying to get this job, and now I'm going to do it my way. Um, that, that's, what I, that's what would be the most interesting thing about that transition, to see whether or not he says, you know what, we're in a kind of a wartime situation, we're going to do a coalition government, or as close to one as. Um, in Obama's case, you know, the, I mean, the, the hardest part for him, I think, is he's got so many ambitious plans and so little money that I, I think when he turns to the country and says, uh, you remember all those things that I want to do? Well, they're kind of on hold because we, we, we're, out of, we're out of cash. And what that reaction is going to be like. Because I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of, of, if Obama wins, I mean, his partisans, uh, if they don't believe that he can stop the seas from rising, they're putting an awful lot of enormous hopes on his shoulders. And I don't know, I don't know how anybody delivers that. Yes. I may be being a little cynical about um, McCain's choice of, of running mate, but um, I viewed it as somewhat pandering to try and get the women's vote and those who may have been supporting Hillary. And what is your sense of that and how women around the country are responding to that? I think that was part, I don't think that's cynical. I think that was part of their notion. In fact, the degree to which they, they had an ad that ran before they picked Palin about um, 18 million people voted for her. And, they, and she wasn't on the ticket because she, she criticized Obama. They, they would like some of that vote. And I, look, if you could wire up, I mean, my dream is to wire up all these guys and ladies to polygraphs it would, or shoot some <laughs> sodium pentothal into them and start asking them some questions. I mean, I'm not talking about waterboarding. I'm talking about, let's see what you really, of course she was picked because she was a woman in part. I mean, that's, that's beyond, they cannot look at, they can't, Look, when George Bush said he picked Clarence Thomas because he was the most qualified jurist in America, you know, there was a horse laugh loud enough to, you know, be heard all around the country. The same thing. Of course she was picked because she was a woman. But, but, but there were other Republican women who were, by the way, much more credentialed, like Senator Hutchinson from Texas. This one fit a particular need to satisfy the conservative base and project a sense of, of um, reform based on her ostensible record in Alaska. 
But will that capture Hillary supporters? Are you getting a, any sense You of know that? what? If you, it, one of the things about the Clinton vote was uh, it's not one vote. What I mean is when we picture a Clinton voter, what, if you picture a, a feminist woman, you know, pro-choice, you go girl, that, that vote was going to come back to Obama anyway. There's no way those voters are going to vote for somebody who wants to overturn Roe, just that alone. But remember, a lot of Hillary Clinton's voters were white working class men, and to get back to a point you made, I'm not sure whether they were voting for her or voting against Obama, either because he was new, untried, unfamiliar, or African American. Those votes are up for grabs, as are the votes of, here, uh, let me see if I can find this number, because it, it answers, yes, here it is. Now, Clinton, got, Clinton did well among, among white men in a lot of states without a college education. And when you talk about white working class, education is more important than income because there are plenty of well-paid folks in construction, skilled trades, who were working class because in terms of their attitudes. And, and college is the best way to judge. Among white men without a college education, Obama is now getting only 30% of their votes. But before you rush to the conclusion that that's racism, John Kerry only got 35% of their votes. And among white women without a college education, he's getting 37% right now. Kerry got 40. So if that's a racial component, it's kind of marginal. It's not like a big, big deal. So the, the way to answer your question is which Clinton voters? And clearly Palin's big punch is, in, as I said before, it's rural, small town, middle of the road, small entrepreneurial types who see the, also who see the, who've been voting Republican more because they see the government as an intrusion rather than a helpmate. In general, women vote more Democratic than men because they see government more as a helpmate. But among these women, uh, they're up for grabs. I think we have time for one or two more questions. All right, let me go away. And Do you think um, if Sarah Palin is in trouble, is a polite way of saying it with Trooper Gate two or three weeks before the election is that will that help or hurt the either side? Oh, you know the answer to that question. <laughs> in fact, in fact, it's so obvious I want to take one more question. <laughs> I mean, if she's in trouble, it's going to hurt her, right? Who, you know, the only guy that ever benefited from being in trouble, well, never mind, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> Um, okay, we've been talking a lot about how Democrats are, have completely, for a long time, have been losing the culture war. Yep. If you are James Carville to Obama tomorrow, mm -hmm. what do you do to turn everything around? Is there something we can do? It seems like no one really has the answer. Do you have the answer? <laughs> um, yeah, he's got to get people talking about something else. He can't win the culture war, but he can make the culture war less relevant by saying it's the, I mean, you quote Mr. Carville, the famous sign in his office, which may have new resonance, is it's the economy, stupid. And that, you know, that he wasn't, that, that sign wasn't directed to voters, it was directed to Clinton staffers saying, keep your eye on the ball. Look, just set it up this way. I mean, uh, Dan Bartlett, who was uh, Bush's counsel and was working for CBS as our Republican consultant, and you know, we have Joe Trippi, the Democrat, said, I don't understand why the Republicans aren't running against Obama as Professor Obama to get back to the culture war. And here's a guy with a Harvard degree who teaches law. And here's the fighter pilot. And when you listen to Obama sometimes, he sounds professorial. You know, now, th there's a lot to admire at that. He's got a very supple mind. He can take things, you know, but in a, but in a campaign dominated by television and short attention span, that may not work. So, if you see what, it, what Carville would tell him is what he's been doing the last several days, is to just go right back to the economy. And McCain gave him an interesting opening in the last 24 hours. I don't mean the Blackberry thing, because that's silly. Um, but I can't wait to see the jokes about this. I mean, The Daily Show tonight, if they, uh, uh, if, <laughs> if they don't have five minutes on this, um, with him, you know, with a abacus uh, or something. <laughs> I'm missing my bet. But um, McCain said either yesterday or today, the fundamentals of the economy are sound. And when he was called on that, he said, well, I mean the fundamentals are the American worker. 
Now, that's not going to fly. That's not what he meant. He meant what everybody means by fundamentals, you know, underlying health of the, of the, you know, the dollar, the manufacturing sector, whatever. But my point about this is, and I, I, I smile at this because, look, since this is the last question, I'm going to take an extra minute. Look, look at where do I live? I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, all right? That we still think the Rosenberg should be pensioned off. I mean, it's a very <laughs> left community. I believe, I believe Ralph Nader got more votes than Bush there in, in 2000. I think that's right. Um, I went to Yale Law School, which is you know, not only the home of Clinton, but in Charles McCarry's novel, uh, Shelley's Heart, it is the center of the left-wing conspiracy. You know, I shop at Zabar's. All right. <laughs> I am of the Hebraic persuasion. So you can do the math and understand, and I vacation more and more in places like Martha's Vineyard, where there are no Republicans except in one tiny community. But I force myself to realize that this is not representative of America. In fact, it's as bad as unrepresentative as you can get. So you know, you really have to get out of that to understand not just what people think, but why it's why it's not. You know, I, mean, I had this conversation with a very well-known Harvard law professor, whose whose identity you might be able to guess, who basically thinks that the, the other side of the culture wars are idiots. They're just morons. Well, if they are, you know. Um, that's, Democrats used to get those votes. They weren't morons when they were voting for Roosevelt, apparently, you know, or Truman or Kennedy. They, got, they became morons when they started voting for Reagan. So what's the explanation? Well, somehow or other, the Democrats have stopped talking to them about uh, in a way that respects them. I think Clinton once said, if you're faced with a choice of being pandered to and condescended to, it's not a hard choice. If that's all you get. So in Obama's case, to, to conclude and actually get back to the question, a relentless conversation about what's gone wrong and how it gets to be fixed and in whose interest he is campaigning, it seems to me, is the way that you say, oh, OK, maybe he is a law professor. You know, maybe he shouldn't have gone to Iowa and complained about the high price of arugula at Whole Foods. You know, maybe, that, maybe that wasn't the way to connect with the good people of Cedar Rapids, which he did, by the way. I mean, that's not, I didn't make that up. Um, you know, Maybe he should have practiced bowling once or twice before he. <laughs> but the point is, you know, get people, in his case, to say this is what most matters, and here's why those guys are wrong and we're right, and you've got to turn to us. Um, and my sense is that's that's where this will turn, unless we have a black swan. You know, there's a very significant book about unpredictability in life called The Black Swan. And it's named after the fact that just because you've never seen a black swan doesn't mean there isn't one. And we've had about three or four black swans in this campaign, and I, I absolutely believe we're going to have one or two more. So with that, thanks very much for listening. Uh